I'm starting a series this morning. I'm really excited about it. This morning's going to stretch us a little with some new concepts. I'm titling this The Power of the Name. The Power of the Name. Colossians 1 verse 9. Now I'm reading from a very literal translation called the Emphasized Bible. It's my very favorite Bible. It's very literal, but it'll sound a little different to you if you've never been associated with it. But it's very accurate and I want to be accurate when we're going through here. As you'll see, it's important of what do these things really mean. So we're going to start Colossians 1.9. For this cause, from the day when, I, when we heard of you, when we found out that the city of Colossae had received the gospel and there are born again believers there, notice what Paul says. I have never stopped praying for you. I'm constantly praying for you. Asking what? Asking that you might be filled unto the personal knowledge of his will. Not a little bit. I'm praying that you'll be, as you grow, as you go day by day, you're learning the scripture. Now you're a new baby Christian. You're, that you would be filled up, not with knowledge, not just with gnosis. This word is not gnosis. It's epignosis in the literal Greek language. And it means a personal, full understanding of something. Like where you've studied engineering and you've been working for 30 years and you are full of understanding about engineering. That's what this word means. I don't want you to just get a little bit of knowledge and get puffed up in pride and think, no, no, I want you to have a personal full knowledge in all wisdom that spiritual wisdom and discernment. That's what Paul was praying for them. Can I say this? I urge all of us to pray for our church, that we would also have these very things at work among us. And many of you have been filled up with much spiritual wisdom and discernment and that personal knowledge already. Verse 10, so that we would walk worthily of the Lord. I remember the first time I read that and it really hit me. And I felt like, God, who could walk worthy of the Almighty of you who he says that you would walk worthily. It's the same word when it says, don't take communion just casually, but do it in a way that's worthy so you don't just take it, yeah, whatever, hey, a couple of bites of a drink. No, but it doesn't mean perfect. It means we're living in a way that we're believing his promises. We are accepting to put on Jesus Christ. We are, in other words, we're walking in a way that the world goes, wow, that guy's different. She's different. She forgives. She's, you know, that's what he's talking about. Unto all pleasing in every good work, bearing fruit and growing in the, what? Personal knowledge of God. Again, not knowledge that makes you proud, but that makes you like Paul say, I want to know him. Oh, I want to know him. Ephesians 4.1. Seems like this is a theme. I exhort you, prisoner of the Lord, to walk in a manner worthy of the calling that you were called with. We've been called with an incredible calling. I'll tell you what the calling is. To be made in the likeness and image of God. As God said in the very beginning, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. That's a high calling. How does it happen? Only one way, through the only one that ever lived it out on this earth, Jesus Christ. We live in him. First Thessalonians 2.12, to the end you might be walking in a manner worthy of God. He's saying this to all these different churches who is calling you unto his own kingdom and glory. Second Thessalonians 1.11, unto which we're also praying constantly, continually, that God might count you worthy of your calling. I urge you, pray for each other, that we would get to that place. And many of us 
are walking, I believe, worthily of our calling. Some are not. Some are not. Some are very casual about their Christian life. It's not that big a deal to them. Colossians 1.11, back to Colossians. With all power, being empowered. I love this. Do you know God has all power? And so all, the only thing stopping us from being utterly empowered is whether we're open to receive his power. Because he's saying, I want to empower you according to the grasp of his glory. There's a phrase you could sit and think about. Grasped by his glory unto all endurance where you're willing to just put one foot in front of the other sometimes and endure under is what it means, tests and trials. And you don't want to escape out and say, I, I can't handle this, I'm gonna escape, I'm gonna escape. He says, stay in the endurance and long suffering. And here's the verse that started this whole thing. I read it about a week ago and I just sat there dazzled. I want some of you to hear this that I know inside you feel, if you're honest, I can't do this. I don't know, God's called it. I want you to hear this verse. I pray you'll believe it. Giving thanks unto the Father that, past tense, has made you and I sufficient. This word means adequate, able, completely able. God has made us, past tense, sufficient for you to have a share in the inheritance of the saints in light. What is the inheritance? So, somebody tell me. Salvation. What else? What's part of our inheritance? Being a joint heir, that's what the inheritance is, and to rule and reign with Jesus Christ on this earth. Can I say this? I think most Christians are only planning on, I mean, are only looking at their life from two views. Get through this life until death or the out translation or eternity and it's very vague. I don't know what in the world eternity. Can I add to that something in between? A thousand year period on this earth to rule and reign with Jesus Christ in real life and to have authority over nations that he gives us. Most people are not planning to live in the millennium, I don't believe, and I think we should. I think it should become very real to us. What would it be like on this earth with Christ Jesus ruling with a rod of iron? If you don't submit, Bad things happen. The earth's gonna be a glorious place. Still sinners, still rebellion, but amazing. I think the energy, transportation, most people just like everybody sitting under their own vine and fig tree, like, I don't know, it's kind of weird, little farms. No, 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 no. That just means everybody has a place. Everybody has freedom. Everybody has like the ability to to be able to thrive, I think we're gonna see fantastic things. I don't believe we're going back to donkeys and... <laughs> no, it's gonna be amazing. But I think we should let sit with God and say, God, really, help me to perceive ruling. But it says he has made you sufficient. So I want you to consciously right now tell the enemy in your mind, I'm done with your insufficiency messages that I get in my email, spiritual email and text every day. Because there's one of two things, either those messages are a lie or God is a liar. Because God says, I've made you sufficient for what I want you to do. Maybe it's a housewife. Doesn't mean he's made you sufficient to be president. He's made you to be sufficient to walk in your lifestyle of who you are. Like Donald said, that's who he is. This is who I am but we're not sufficient in ourselves. Paul says we're only sufficient because God's made us sufficient. The news gets better. 
verse 13. God has rescued us out of the authority of the darkness. You used to live under the authority of the darkness. It had authority over you. And translated us into the kingdom of the son of his love. You got translated from Spanish into English or English into French. That's what translated means. You, you became a whole new language spiritually in whom we have our redemption. That redemption means purchased with a price, bought back out of the pawn shop. You're redeemed. You're not in Satan's pawn shop anymore. He can't hold you. And he can't put a ceiling on you unless you receive it. Boy, you're quiet today. You're, you're like Anglicans today or Episcopal. Okay. Now, now it gets really interesting. This is describing our Lord Jesus Christ. Who is an who is an image of the unseen, the invisible God? Scripture is very clear. God is invisible. He's immortal. He cannot die. And I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I'm just going to make the point. God did not die on the cross. And I remember, and I love Jimmy Swigert, but Jimmy Swigert said, if you don't believe God died on the cross, you're not saved. Well, I'm sorry, God didn't die on the cross. Jesus Messiah, Jesus Christ, that's what Jesus Christ, Jesus Messiah, the Lamb of God died on the cross and God accepted the Lamb's sacrifice. God doesn't die. He's immortal, but he's also invisible. How many of you have seen God this week? No. Okay. This word image means it's icon in the Greek. It means a representation, like a statue. It even means mirror-like. Like it exactly looks like what it's representing. These are the words actually used. High definition reflection that exactly reflects its source. What it directly corresponds to. More than a mere shadow, but instead like a replication. When we see Jesus Christ, how he lived, walked, talked, ministered, didn't minister, refused that, how he talked to, now this is a representation of God. Are you ready? To the religious ones who were suppressing the truth and keeping people from freedom and life and truth, Jesus said, you are dangerous poisonous vipers, you're dangerous snakes. You're like whited sepulchers. Now that sounds kind of nice in the King James. You know what that means? Here, Jesus is standing in front of the religious leaders saying, you are like a tomb that has a nice white painted monument, but inside of you, you're that corrupt maggot infested dead carcass rotting in the ground. That's how filthy you are spiritually. That, those words represented God. That's how he feels about religion that kills people. That should make us not want to insist on religion for our own life. Here's what religion brings. In every case, fog, fear, obligation, and then guilt. I'm afraid of you, God, so I'm obligated to come to your church and, and then I'm still guilty. That's what religion brings. Roman Catholicism, come, confess your sins to a man, go away still feeling guilty, but you're obligated to keep doing it because you're living in fear. Who the sun sets free is free, indeed. So everything we see of Jesus don't push those little kids away. Come here, I want them on my lap. I, oh, I love these little, that's God. We're seeing how God feels towards kids. Is this really true? Listen to what Jesus said in John 12. This is so powerful, I keep doubting that it's really happening because of last week <laughs> when nothing worked. 
And Jesus cried aloud and said, he that believes on me doesn't actually just believe on me. He's actually believing on him, God, that sent me. And he that views me actually is viewing him that sent me. When you look at me, walking, talking, to marry this, eating, Zacchaeus, come down, you're seeing God. I, I want you to get this. We have so many misconcepts. That's why God sent his only son. So we could see what he's really like. I know that sounds like so trite. We've heard it a hundred times in sermons, but it's powerful and revelatory. Neither do I condemn you, woman, right now, probably naked, laying here in front of all these men, caught in adultery. I'm not condemning you. I, I, any of you want to throw stones? I'm not condemning her. Do you want to do it? And then he sits down and writes. I believe he was writing out their sins, the people that were standing, all the men standing there. I think he bent down and started writing their sins. I believe first he wrote the commandments. You shouldn't commit fornication. You shouldn't. This is just my opinion. Because then it says, I'm not condemning her. And then it says he started writing again. I think he was writing. It's just what I think. And it says they all left down to the very last one. And I've always thought, I remember reading that and I thought, wow, that guy was hardcore. Who was the <laughs> last one? Like, oh, I was so fired up to stoner today. Oh, oh rats, okay. I mean, that's a hard picture for me. The last guy there. Don't be the last guy in our church that wants to condemn somebody that's struggling, okay? Be the first, mercy. Okay, Jesus, I get, I get it, I get it. By the way, where was the guy? Hmm? Hmm? Where was the guy? He was, takes two to dance. See the hypocrisy? Verse 49, I, out of my own self, didn't even speak. But the Father who sent me has given me commandment what I should say and what I should speak. Jesus was not living by a conscience. He was living by revelation from his Father. I hope you'll think about that. We live by conscience way too much. And God wants to transfer our living to revelation. So we don't just see the rules. We see the revelation in the situation. I love this. Verse 50. And I know that his commandment is everlasting life. Everything my father commands brings life. And I want to say this to us. The best advice I ever got when we started a home meeting, Nance and I had left a church we'd been in for 12 years, just knew we could not continue in that. Started a home group and I called a pastor friend of mine in Spokane and I told him kind of some things I was thinking about starting to teach on, on our, at our first meeting. And he paused and he said, Jamie, I would encourage you to do one thing. Ask yourself a question. Okay, Jim, what? Is it going to bring life? Whatever you're going to teach, is it going to bring life? And I changed the topic. It was one I wanted to teach on. But when he said it, I knew it wasn't the right one. And so I want to encourage you in your life, in every situation, what I'm ready to say to my wife, what I'm ready to say at work, what I'm ready to say to my adult kid who just went out and used again, is it going to bring life or is it going to bring death? What's it going to bring? Jesus said, everything my father commands brings life. So if you are living under commandments that keep bringing you death and others death, it's not his commandment, it's his satanic commandments if it's bringing death to people around us. And you may want to ask someone else because we often can't tell if we're bringing life or not. We think we are and others are too afraid to tell us, I'm sorry, you 
are a flamethrower of death everywhere you go. And sometimes we actually need to tell someone that. And they probably won't be your friend anymore, at least for a while. But they need to hear it sometimes. But you could say it in one situation and it's death, but in the other it's life. That's why we need revelation. When to speak, when not to. Will pastor tell us when? I don't know. Let him tell you, because I don't know. You need to hear from heaven. My sheep hear my voice. Um, And he says, all the things I'm speaking are exactly what my father's given me to speak. Wouldn't it be awesome if I could stand up here and say, guys, everything I've ever said to you is from the father. You guys would be like, yeah, right. Please remember when you... Now it gets exciting. It says, Jesus was the firstborn of all creation. Firstborn of all creation. This is why I said this is going to stretch some of you. It's not talking about the Genesis creation. Not talking about giraffes and elephants and water and trees. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 tells us what this creation that Christ is the firstborn of. On the contrary, now no longer are we gaining it. He's talking about we're no longer going to recognize each other after our lower nature, our humanness. Would that change the church? Universally, if tomorrow morning every Christian got up And supernaturally, they were able to recognize each person that they encountered, not knowing them after the flesh, knowing them after God's view, after his spirit, who they really are. So that if anyone is in Christ, there's a new creation, a new creation. Old things pass away. How many of you found old things passed away when you met Jesus Christ and gave your life to him? How many had things pass away? Everything became new because we became a new creation in Christ Jesus. All things, moreover, are of God who has reconciled us unto himself through Christ and has given unto us the reconciling ministry. Here's what he's saying. Every one of us that have asked forgiveness, believed that what Jesus did was sufficient, we got saved, we are part of the new creation, we've been reconciled back to God because Isaiah said there used to be a wall between you and your God because of our sins. There was a wall, you couldn't get to God. Your spirit was dead. So this new creation is when our spirit is birthed, begotten from above. Jesus said, you can't see the kingdom of heaven unless you've been not born again, begotten from above is what it says. We have to have a spiritual birth. 